Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Tomas, for inviting me uh, to have this lecture here. It's, I'm very happy uh, to come to Brno. It's not my first time, hopefully also not my last time. Every time I enjoy it. Um, today I'm going to sp speak about two smaller towns, two smaller regions um, of the Habsburg uh, Empire. One at the very bridge, uh, at the very borderline next to Venetia, the small Carniola and a bit bigger one, uh, Styria. Um, and I feel like introducing the two, showing to you two different approaches that I did during my research so far, um, quantitative and qualitative approach and the comparisons between the, um, the data and the, the, the new findings um, so far in my research. Um, if you don't mind, I will sit so I um, see the slides a bit better. Um, so um, if I start with the geographics <laughs> data, um, so Carniola and Styria once a part of Inner Austria, so the most south uh, western um, uh, territory of Habsburg Empire but quite different in their character. Carniola, quite close to Venice, Venetian Republic borderline, also uh, reflects in the democratic, the, in the demographic um, um, structure um, of the nobility, which I'm going to talk about. Um, there were a lot of um, traders, dealers coming from Italian towns as a new nobility in the 17th century, um, uh, working in Ljubljana as a difference from uh, Styria uh, with the main capital Graz, um, the largest town, um, which um, perhaps a little bit like Moravia and Bohemia was more characterized by the older uh, nobility as the main uh, collectors, as the most visible patrons um, um, in, the, in this territory. So uh, the two capitals were quite different. You see the Ljubljana population in 1680s um, was just a little bit over 7,500, so 7,800 people. It's a, like a, a bigger village um, back then, uh, whereas the population in the entire Carniola, so the entire province extended with the county of Gorizia, which is now, of course, part of Italy, and the, um, the, Austrian, um, the Austrian coastline, which is a part of Croatia, was around 290,000. Of course, the noble percentage of nobles that were my main field of research as far as the um, owning um, patterns of owning paintings is concerned, it, it's um, around 5%. So the entire Carniola could not have more than 40,000 um, noble people. Um, and of course, not of them own paintings, we would imagine. Um, uh, Graz was once as large, uh, it was the capital of Inner Austria and that shows also um, in the structure of the town um, with 15,000 population and as, as I mentioned, um, uh, quite, a lot, quite a lot of um, high noble families um, present there. Um, with also a little bit different historical background. Graz was the capital of entire inner Austria and it also had a court until 1619, which influenced, um, which influenced the patronage patterns, um, influenced the influxion of artists, um, influenced, influenced the cultural exchange in the town. Um, but this, of course, changed after Archduke Ferdinand, the um, uh, Ferdinand of Finland, Austria, um, became emperor, moved to Vienna, leaving the court entirely behind, actually abandoned it, abandoning everything that also the um, 
the furnishings, including the collection, the Kunstkammer of his parents, leaving behind that as well in um, in the Burg, so in the in the in the castle, where it stayed until the mid 18th century, in the time where, um, uh, of course, the, the time of centralizing Habsburg collections in Vienna, then under Maria Theresia. Um, the collection, um, what, what was left of it was moved um, to Vienna. So this is the, the, the basic historical context I'm going to talk about, um, actually more about, with reference to Carniola, so the, the first um, province that I'm going to deal about, um, not so much with collections, but with um, owning paintings. I did a quantitative research of, of the pre pre paintings presented in the provent inventories of 302 um, noble people, um, which we cannot always call collections. So it's actually um, an, just owners. Um, and um, well, for the difference with, um, with Styria, where there is a um, larger number of higher nobility, um, actually co the collecting comes more quickly, um, becomes more apparent and um, easier also to research. There's more archival information about it. Um, what was significant for the entire history of collecting in Central Europe, of course, was the, um, it started um, to become more important after the transmission of, of the grand um, collection of Archduke Leopold uh, Willem from Brussels to Vienna in 1656, um, and the um, subsequent publication of his first major album, Teatrum Pictorium, uh, which was actually, um, as documented, um, owned by a number of Carniolan and Styrian uh, nobles. They actually had this book, this big album, in their libraries, and they used it um, to, to try to come closer with their paintings or the, the, they, their taste to, to the largest collection in, in Vienna, the most important one, the Archducal collection, which of course uh, was donated, uh, was given to, to Leopold I. And he, of course, then um, it, it was um, displayed in, in Stahlburg um, uh, in the complex um, of uh, um, a little bit outside Hofburg then. So this is one aspect um, with, um, among the owners of, of, um, of this heritage of um, album was also one of the most intellectually active um, Carniola nobles. He was uh, a newly nobilitated, he was uh, um, uh, a member of the lower nobility. He called himself Baron, but he actually even wasn't. His name was Johann Weikart Valvasor, and he was the owner of the collection of 7,500 prints and drawings. Um, at least 7,500 of them remain, uh, were subsequently sold by himself when he bankrupted to Zagreb, where, where they remain. And among them also, for example, um, uh, a series of David Tenier's drawings, um, including, um, at least this is how it was um, evaluated, attributed by Erwin Pokorny, uh, a possible preparatory drawing for one of his um, uh, picture galleries, of one of the versions version of picture galleries um, of Archduke um, Leopold Willem, one of the paintings. So um, also the Carniola nobility uh, lived with this idea, knew um, of course um, what it was, uh, what the, the Archducal collection was, what the structure of the collection was, and that was the, 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 the grand uh, model 
um, for first credit collections from the mid 17th century onwards, when these patterns of owning paintings um, emerged. Um, that was one aspect. The second one was fluctuation of artists. And um, both us Moravia, I would say, and us Vienna, of course, also uh, Carniola and Styria were marked by a fluctuation of Netherlandish painters um, coming from basically already 60s of the 17th century. Well, some individuals came even earlier, but um, 60s of the 17th century were such a mark. And especially later on, after the, um, after the crisis in the north, uh, especially in the Netherlands, the so-called disaster year, Rampjar, uh, which was caused by, um, by the, um, the uh, Anglo, um, what, uh, Dutch French, French war and later on Anglo-Dutch wars, um, caused the, um, caused the financial breakdown of the many um, Netherlandish painters, the bad economic, um, the bad economic situation, um, the bankrupts of, of many art dealers, and subsequent, subsequent migration. And Central European nobility apparently had quite a good purchasing uh, power. Uh, not only just to accommodate these painters, but also to, to afford um, better quality paintings that were uh, traded by art dealers, um, such, a, such as for cons that I will um, later on talk about um, a bit more in detail. Um, when I finished my studies, um, uh, this book was published. Mapping markets for paintings in Europe, um, and I was quite inspired by its <laughs> by its introduction. Um, it was um, edited by Neil de Marquis and Hans van Michrutz. These were the two big names. Um, uh, one is economist, one is art historian, and th th those uh, big names um, who did the quantitative studies. Of the Netherlandish um, of the Netherlandish collections as well, so um, uh, I was quite taken with this introduction, uh, which this is the, a small quotation from it, exactly with this sentence that there is nothing on Eastern Europe. Of course, from American point of view, Eastern Europe is entire Austria. Uh, it is also Slovenia. It is uh, Czech Republic. It's Poland. Basically, Central Europe. There, there, there was nothing on Central Europe, and I said, "Well, why not try to do to do something on it?" Um, so I had a, an, an opportunity to study uh, some time in Antwerp already as a, as a master student, and later on as a PhD student in Amsterdam. Um, so I would attend their master courses and some of them uh, some of them there was a lot of talk about this kind of um, research in, into economic social art history um, and I read a lot about um, the works of uh, Montias, Longman, Martin Mianbok was at that department where I studied um, and I came um, in contact also with Bruno Blondet um, 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 and um, at that time, uh, a bit, um, a couple of years ago, uh, a nice book of Isabella Cecchini uh, was um, published on a quantitative an analysis on um, Venetian picture collections. This, most of these people are either historians or economists. Um, so of course, I cannot compare myself with them in the sense of developing a big uh, quantitative um, approach. But I did take uh, a data set of Carniolian inventories, and I tried to work with that. Um, so basically, about carnial inventories, um, they are how they are stored. It is very conveniently for this kind of research. 
Um, they are all separated from the rest of Landricht. Um, so they are separated in, in a special font. Um, only the inventory, so we exactly know what is their number um, and what kind of data set you, you, cho you choose within, within the basic uh, source. There are two types. One records um, the paintings, that is especially before uh, the beginning of the 18th century, this type is more common, only within a rubric, so it, within a chapter where only paintings are trans, uh, recorded um, without their reference from, um, of, um, or of premises in which they're hanged. The other one offers also premises, so they are according to the rooms in which they hang. Uh, from around 700, they also include valuations, but those valuations seem to have large discrepancies. They are difficult to study, they are not consistent. Um, if we compare them with purchase prices, the little of purchase prices we can get from the account books, we see that, um, well, um, a, a, quantitative, a quantitative analysis of prices would not be a good, uh, prices in the inventory valuations would not be a good idea. Um, so I worked with those and I went through this, this fundus, which was about 1,400 45 inventories of nobles dating between 1544 and 1813. Um, of course, this, this is not an equally arranged source. So we have the most of the inventories from the later periods from 1750s onwards. And um, um, in that time, they're getting more and more generalized. So the paintings are not um, they are not recorded uh, in detail um, with, regra with regards to subject matter. Uh, we face the pro problem, of course, that not of all inventories include paintings. Um, at least 25 for every of the, of the decades um, of them do not include paintings at all. And there are many that also include paintings only refer to as a painting or 20 paintings and those um, for me they were um, not that convenient of course I wanted to know what subject matters people um, had in their in their um, in their homes um, that's why I'm calling this this, uh, this thing the demand study the study of demand or the owning patterns not the owning of not the co collecting study studies because some of them only own 10 to 15 paintings and that you cannot call the collection but you have to include it in your data set because it matches your um, because it matches your standards and my standards uh, was um, that inventory should include records of at least two paintings with defined subject I set this standard according to the source itself um, that they should not be repeated uh, within several generations, which was quite of a tricky because I had to know um, the um, I had to know the inheritance patterns of the people. So, paintings of the grandsons and, uh, for example, from grandfathers, they were recorded again if they were inherited, and that I had to exclude. Um, and that showed a little bit on my sample. Um, but in any way, I selected my data set of 302 nobles. Um, it was a little bit more than, um, well, 15,700 items, so pictures. And that was the main data set and that, that I put into my system and I arranged it according to the ranks. Um, of course, um, the lower nobility, the ranks um, that, I, that are in my data set are matching the ranks um, distribution of the population in Carniola in that time. There were al always more 
people of the lower nobility that there, of course, were of higher ranks. So the, the lower nobility was always around 65 percentage um, um, until 1750s, where, where a number of higher ranks um, went a little bit up. So um, with this chart, I just saw that the, um, the data set matches the this population, the main population of, of Carniola. I had a little bit more problems with arranging this distribution of inventories with regards to the gender. Um, the problem was that I had two little women and that matches my condition that I didn't want to have repetitions. Um, so I had to omit all the widows inherited who inherited the, paint, the paintings from their husbands and of course that means that i my female representative um, um distribution was a little bit on the bad side i didn't want to cover this by adding more women because it would just um, it would not reflect the problem the problem would be that actually the women uh, women did not own so many paintings by by themselves that there would be um, in the probate inventories marked as as their own in the cases that women did have their own collections there it was always said this and this painting is owned by by her and the others were inherited or in the even in the male um, in the male uh, inventories we'd have in the in the painting records mentioned which one was actually owned by uh, by the wife so uh, to me this is a, a sign of the fact that women did own less paintings they rarely owned their own collections but it, that doesn't mean that they didn't have any say in the creation of the collections or the purchase of the um, the paintings owned by their husbands. That was a different matter and that was of course the matter of the qualitative study that you make when you do the archival, archival research. Um, so um, the next thing that I wanted to check was how many paintings there were um, in average in Carnelian noble households. Um, so um, you see now that between 1615 and 1659 the thing only started and we have to emphasize here again that Carniola is a small region, quite peripheral, a province um, with no great art production in the middle of the 17th century by the Carniolans themselves. Only a couple of painters coming and living there, most of them um, temporarily on their way further on to Vienna, uh, to Graz and Vienna and, and further. So this showed also in the owning patterns, of course. Um, but you see also that the, um, the number of paintings steadily grows and it grows only until, let's say, around 700, 1700s. These are the people who died in 1710, 1790, 19, meaning that they purchased these paintings quite sooner. When you have a, when you have study of probate inventories, you have to calculate that it could be 15 to 25 years um, in between the, the very purchasing and then of course the, the owning paintings upon your death. Um, so the collections grew, but then after the mid, let's say already after the 1740s, 1730s, they declined down and this, this trend matches also the trend in other parts of Europe. Um, with a little bit of delay. 
um, for 18th century, for example, we have um, studied by um, Martin Jan Bock for Amsterdam inventories. He says that throughout the 18th century, there is a steady decrease in the ownership of paintings. So for me, yes, owning paintings and owning so many of them, I also wanted to check how, how large how large versus small painting assemblies changed throughout the time. And um, well, this chart basically shows, this chart basically here shows the collectors. Here are the persons who had hundreds or more paintings. This, you can already define that they're, they tried to, to be collectors, that they had this, and you see that the, the, the mid 17th century, there was hardly any. So this is probably just one or so. Um, and that this um, number went much up in the time of the 18th century, whereas the number of people owning little paintings went uh, tremendously down. So um, there was a trend towards owning more and more paintings um, in Carniola. The subject matters. Um, I did my own according to how the how the paintings were transcribed how the paintings were defined in the inventories um, i tried to to put them into categories here maybe i did some bad work with the translation should be a bit more defined so a uh, new testament actually includes also the simple the simple um, subject matters such as um, Mary, um, this is the, the most ultimate painting everybody owned, of course, the um, Our Lady, um, sometimes of course also Our Lord, and uh, maybe their own um, name patron saints. So this is the also in this category, also the very basic um, subject matters are included. And you see that in the first, um, in the first half of the 17th, uh, oh, in the second half of the 17th century, um, this is by far the prevailing um, the prevailing um, theme in Carniolan collections. What I also did was I arranged the same categories upon the decades, but. Um, that chart would be a bit too complex and it actually doesn't say much more than this one. So this actually changed in the, in the, throughout the 17th century. It, there you see the process of secularization of corneal, corneal and paintings. It reflects the general state in European collecting practices. So, um, more or more, more varied subject matters appeared. Um, for example, still lives become popular, genre scenes become popular. I was interested in the Netherlandish part here, so I made a special a special category of the so-called Hollandische or Nederlandische Stücke basically a genre work of lowland lowland scene uh, not necessarily by Netherlandish masters also could be a copy or anything but this is how they um, named them this is how they named them basically also in the Netherlandish probate inventory list the Netherlands is took um, so this kind of paintings prevail um, I mean, prevail, they, they become more and more popular. The, among the uh, secular artworks, landscapes, of course, are the, let's say, the most popular, um, the most popular subject matter. Um, what also becomes less is allegories. 
um, there is a very um, underrepresentative um, number of Old Testament scenes and very little of uh, histories, but there is a good uh, share and I divided them deliberately into family portraiture and political portraiture. Political portraiture basically means the emperors or the bishops as well sometimes. Um, so it was important to have a portrait of the emperor or the portrait of the provincial governor in your place if you were a, a noble. And the comparison I did for the first um, for the, the first 50 years, so the, the, from the mid 17th century to, to the, the end of the 17th century, um, with, with Venice and with Amsterdam, and you can see the basic differences. The, the Venice and Carniola um, go ha quite um, hand in glove, so. Um, with the number of religious scenes um, and let's say, well, Carniolans have a little bit more of landscapes um, and um, let's say um, the Venetians are still better in histories, histories meaning Old Testaments and mythological scenes, um, uh, similar in, in still lives, a bit, a bit more of genre scenes, but with, with um, with Amsterdam, and I think probably the same would be with the Flemish, uh, there is much more of, of course, of secular works, of course, of genre scenes and of still lives, whereas they put, um, Longman and Montias put um, religious histories and mythologies and uh, a religious work all together. And this whole category is, is smaller than just the religious works of um, of in Carniola in Venice, Venice. So you see this 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 different patterns of this of taste of um, owning preferences in the three different regions of Europe. I was still not satisfied with that, so I wanted to see how the uh, how genres and still lives grew, uh, the number of of families or the number of owners, collectors, owning um, still lives and genre paintings. So um, in 1650s, you had approximately 20% of Cornell and noble people um, owning a still life, whereas a bit more than 10% owned the genre work. And this, you see that it grew um, quite um, much um, by the time of 700. Um, also, of course, because of the offer, because of um, mostly um, Netherlandish artists coming to, um, to, to Ljubljana, settling there for some time and feeling the demand of the locals. Um, this in case of genre works increased but dropped in case of still lives a little bit with 7050 to uh, later on to to the second half of the 18th century and what what were the paintings that the, they tried to have or that they thought they have so the attributions we can never um, consider them um, that they actually were um, what they own. So um, if the Rubens is mentioned in the inventory, we have to consider the fact that it was not necessarily a Rubens, but at least the, at least the owner, uh, the deceased owner thought it was, or the, his family who welcomed the commissioner who would make the inventory. Um, they believed it was Rubens. And this is, um, only the master painters. Um, you also notice that the numbers are quite low. So this is where the problem begins. And this is because this is, um, well, let's say we are not in Holland, we are not in Amsterdam. The connoisseurship level is not as high as there. So the number of attributions in Cornell and inventories is, there are 5% of inventories that include the attribution, whereas in Venetian, 
inventories, there is 90% of inventories that include attributions, whereas Montias uh, was quite lucky because he could only use the attri attributed inventories. He could just drop um, those that did not include attributions. So, um, but basically we see what the taste was was going towards and it is a quite classic taste um, for the Habsburg for the Habsburg territory directed into Flemish to Venetian and if we remind ourselves if now of, of the, this big role model of Leopold Willem we see that it is that he made an impression and that he set the standards, of course, that the nobility tried to somehow approach um, in a, with accordance to their, um, to their purchasing power and to, their, uh, to the accessibility of, of the, the works. Um, who was actually delivering paintings is inter interesting, in, uh, interesting uh, question. Um, in Ljubljana, we have records of Venetian um, for the low, low standard paintings. So we consider them low standard uh, because they were mentioned as Venetian peddlers. There were several of them in, um, staying in Ljubljana and uh, the guild at the end of the 17th century, the guild complains about them. So, of course, they were not happy with the, uh, with the offer they would provide. Um, we also have records um, already in the 1660s about the Flemish, um, Flemish peddlers and these were general merchants also selling paintings so we think they were not specialized, they were, they were just selling let's say average quality or even below average quality paintings but in a way they could to some extent, ex extent um, meet the demand of the local clientele. clientele. Um, but, well, um, the, the high, the, the, the biggest demand or the must was met by the Netherlandish painters, um, coming to Ljubljana and staying there, at least for some time. We have Almanach and the number of attribution, the number of paintings attributed to him exceeds everything else. That is funny, that is unusual. If we compare that to anything else, also with, um, I tried to, to do the same thing um, on 150 inventories from Styria, I'm still collecting them. We don't have this phenomena there. Um, so um, about this guy, Almanach, this was supposed to be his nickname, but we, lately it was discovered by our colleague, Uros Lube, that it was actually his name and that he traveled further on um, to Vienna. Um, I'm going to show him some, I'm going to show you some of his works um, a bit later on. Then it was, you see that the, 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 the first, um, the first lines are, are filled with Flemish names. There were no, really no um, very popular local painters in Corniola in the second half of the 17th century. Um, the, off, the demand was filled by the offer coming from, coming from north. Uh, then it was Peter Aurex, um, by his name, um, it is clear that he be, uh, came from, from Flanders and could probably he did uh, originate in a family of tapestiers. Um, one of them was present also in Venice, um, the tapestry makers. And he actually became um, Landesstendige Maler. So he, he got his, his job, permanent job, and stayed until his death, um, providing, um, providing the um, nobility and also the, the estates uh, regularly with um, artworks. Then it is Sebastian Verport. We know actually basically nothing about him. They nicknamed him Niederlander. He just appears in, um, in, um, in the inventories. Um, Johann Koch, he was, um, he was not a local, but um, 
came um, and worked with uh, Valvasor for some time. Johann Franz Gladich of Croatian descent, but there are just two paintings uh, uh, attributed to him. Um, uh, Antonio Bellucci in Trespassing. Um, Giulia Quaglio actually was a ceiling painter, but um, he also um, obviously was in the time he was not making um, uh, a big ceiling projects. He was also working on canvas. Anton Swonians again Flemish, uh, but uh, we do not have any church record information that he would be staying in Ljubljana. Um, and Johann Karl Remp, um, he was uh, of Kornil origin, but he moved later on first to Styria and to Vienna. So this is how it is in the province. <laughs> um, so this is what you saw in the charts. Now with, the, um, with a little bit of um, pictures, um, the surviving works of Almanac um, in the National Gallery are only these four of those 78 at least um, recorded in the inventories. Nothing else is known that he was then that he was present here in the end, end in the end of the 70s, and then he went to Vienna when he is mentioned in the church records. Um, so we are kind of blank with his. The, the 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 gist would be to go to find him in Antwerp because we have one one record mentioning that he's coming from there from there and i did one when i was a bit well 10 years ago i was uh, i got one scholarship and i was quite happy to try to try to search for this guy in antwerp but it is like searching for a needle in the there is no record of him there um, either so the next step would be to try in vienna but um quite traditional in his style, Caravagesque, um, mixturing with, um, with uh, um, genre works, which suggests the influence of Central European genre of the time and of, um, um, of even possibly Northern Italian, um, Northern Italian elements. So, could be that he came from Carniola, from some of the Italian town where he was just making a normal tour that no Netherlandish painters often did. That's why uh, um, they have this, um, this definition as a traveling painters often traditionally, at least in Slovenian literature, there was, they were always mentioned as traveling painters because they took, um, they were slowly progressing towards Vienna and stopped also in Italian towns. Um, Peter Aurax, actually, did, we are a bit uh, even less lucky with him because we know he stayed in Ljubljana. He is frequently mentioned in the church records, but we have two altar paintings that we know that are his um, in the Ljubljana Ursuline Church. So this that of Saint Ursula and another, and another of the pendant. Um, from 1711, and we have this, um, well, this uh, hunting scene. Um, for us, it's important that it is signed and dated uh, in the time that he was that he was present in Ljubljana for sure. It was uh, sold to Doroteum uh, in Doroteum in 215. It comes from um, from one castle collection in Loge near Vipava. Um, and it could travel there later on in the 18th century. So this was, it was not made for that castle collection. Um, and the painters that are not mentioned in inventories, but we have church records of, that's the, the, the other confusion that we get. Uh, we have Hermann Ferrost, um, those who do early modern art in Moravia also um, probably came across of his name. Um, he, he also stopped in Vienna, he worked quite a lot there. Uh, he spent some time in Ljubljana, painted a couple of portraits, 
1681, he's mentioned in the church records, nothing of him in the inventory records of, of the, um, of the uh, Carniolan clientele, but he is mentioned in the church, uh, in the record, in the inventory records of Styrians um, somehow. And then we have Eustace van den Nijpoort, who you probably also know because he went uh, further to Vienna and then to Moravia and worked for, um, for um, uh, Kastel, um, Liechtenstein Kastel Korno in, um, in Kromerich Holmouts. Um, so he was present quite some time in Carniola. He never appears in the inventory, so we would say that somebody, uh, he painted mostly for one commissioner, and we believe that commissioner was Johann Weikart Walbazor, uh, the special guy that I mentioned uh, that he owned a, a big um, print collection. Well, he also had a workshop, a printing workshop, uh, with a couple of painters living at this castle of his in Bogensberg. Um, and um, Eustace van der Nijper was one of them. He stayed um, in, at his castle and um, we, um, we have accounts of his children's births and him as a witness in, in the church nearby in this, in this parish. Um, and just as a comparison with those 150 inventories which I did, um, now, the, I have to say that um, recording Styrian inventories for me is much more tricky. They are in the large fondus of Landrecht. Uh, they are not documented within the computer system. So when you actually order the boxes, you don't know how many inventories you will get. And the rest is the contracts, the, the other Landrecht stuff, so the, the estate court stuff. Um, so when you select a source, uh, a data set, you don't know what it represents. That's what, um, um, but I, I did collect 150 of them. I transcribed them. Most of them, unfortunately, are only from higher nobility. And that makes them difficult to, to compare with the Carniolans because in Carniola you have a lot, but I included lower nobility to make it equal. Um, and here, of course, you have um, much richer clientele um, according to the attribution uh, attributions that they offer in, the, in their inventories. Um, well, the, the taste was a bit similar, went a little bit more, a little bit more, more versatile. For example, Karl Rutkart appear, appears several times. Uh, it is funny because we have Karl Rutkart. Uh, documented in Ljubljana, but no paintings of him, whereas in Styria, and the same, as I mentioned already, um, Harman Ferest um, um, is the same, and we even have um, Nyport uh, mentioned in um, uh, Styrian inventories, but this is just a chart that, um, that kind of um, records the, um, the masters that did not work locally in Styria. So this is basically the taste and I just also um, put out the um, valuations to just to show how large discrepancies are between paintings and that the, um, we cannot rely on them. We also see one and the same paintings with several so different valuations that um, it's quite useless to, to, to study um, prices based on, on inventories. So they, had, they have to be purchasing prices only to do any kind of analysis um, on them, fortunately. Um, so, um, uh, another, big, another big person who did a lot of um, who did a lot of uh, 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 charts, and now here I'm finishing with the charts because I see your faces go a bit down, <laughs> and I'm done. I promise. Um, so was Sandra Hinhoven, and she did um, she did a nice um, a nice um, study 
on the trade of the four cones, concentrated mostly on their trade to um, to Americas and to Spain, which was their which was their basic uh, trade. Uh, whereas um, Central, Euro Central Europe here marked yellow was just was a smaller part of their trade, but um, uh, they sold there the paintings that were higher in quality in comparison to uh, America and Spain. Uh, this is just from her book um, uh, as a general introduction to the towns that they, are, they, they were selling, just to show that it was not just the Central European trade that they were working on. Of course, it was a smaller part. Uh, they were selling to Holland, to Spain, and to German towns, uh, and of course within, within Flanders as well. And um, what she doesn't mention in her book so explicitly, but what, what is seen from her, their correspondence is that the level, level of connoisseurship of Central European clients um, was not that good. In comparison with um, in comparison with Flemish and the Dutch, you will see that um, they accepted what they got more more or less, but some of them were quite capricious. So um, from Lubomir Slavicek's um, studies, these are the, the things that um, you probably read about. They um, they came to. Um, Vienna in 1665, um, Guillaume uh, or Hillian, um, the older, traded with Vienna already before, but in 1665 he sends um, his first son, Alexander, comes um, to Vienna, um, uh, and later on um, his second son, Hillian uh, the Younger, who was a painter, um, and subsequently Marcus and Melchior. Um, so they make a family branch here in Vienna and decide to distribute all the paintings that were no longer of use in Brussels or Antwerp. So these were pre-owned paintings. Most of them were auctioned um, after bankruptcies of people. So already used um, in um, Flemish interiors and then dispatched um, to Central Europe. And they had some painters, uh, they had some permanent contracts with Flemish painters who were working and dispatching, uh, like Alexander Castiles was or Jan Paul Hillemans. Um, um, and there was some uh, contemporary pr other painters like Justo Daniels um, who painted different um, motifs that were liked by um, Central Europe clientele. Uh, they, when um, Hilliam Forcont, who was trained as painter, comes to Vienna, he first um, comes in connection with, with Jan de Hert, so the, the, uh, the painter um, who was working in Vienna, and later on with Walter Count Leslie. And um, from the correspondent of the Helium with his father, it's, it's a sad story, he sends his father a letter, oh, I came here I, and, and I found um, um, there is a Count Leslie, and he would like to, he would like me as his Hof uh, Mahler. He would like um, to make a contract with me to work for him. He's in need of painter. And then 10 years, 10, ten days later, um, fa Father Hilliom um, in Antwerp gets another letter that the guy died. And this was just in 1667 in, the, in 10 days. And this, um, Hilliom, probably wanted to be a painter first in Vienna. He tried that and then um, probably because of large demand of customers, of clients, he decided also to join um, his older brother, Alexander, who was um, apothecary by profession. So um, they started with uh, a mass trade from Antwerp to Central Europe. And I was doing their research. I, would, I was doing my research um, um, mostly about how the paintings came to Graz.
I was interested in. Um, I know that there was no trade with Ljubljana, demand was too small, or demand was completely covered by those Netherlands painters that I previously mentioned, because the community was so small. But Graz, there was, a, there was quite a big demand for these paintings. So they came from, they, they sent on this patch paintings from Antwerp. They, on Köln, they would enter the Rhine River trade. They would, in Regensburg, change to the New River trade, to Linz, and from there directly to Graz. They didn't go to Vienna. They would dispatch painting directly to Graz for Styrian customers. Of course, they were quite happy with them. Some actually even got them. For example, Count Trautmannsdorf, who was um, owner of this, then it was still Neuhaus, but later on Traut, uh, Trautenfels Castle, he got them home um, delivered. Um, and this research I have done on, um, on this archive, this is UNESCO protected archive of all bankrupt companies. And of course, for Kant, Font is one of them. And most of the research that has been done for Central Europe, it was done via Denosé. So via transcription that Jan Denosé made of the, um, of the shipments um, and from the account books um, of the for Kant. But there is much more left in this archive. There are letters from the customers from Austria to them. And I don't know, well, maybe I, I, I have a feeling why. Um, why um, there's the most of the customers that sent letters to Forkont are actually from Styria. You have around 220 letters um, of the Styrians. I would say so because um, the Forkons didn't have so many contacts, um, direct contacts with the Styrians. So these were letters from the Styrians sent to Alexander and Guillaume to Vienna. Um, they probably didn't, didn't come regularly to, to Graz, whereas I, um, I searched for the, um, in the records to find, for example, Con uh, letters from Bohemian nobility or for, um, from Moravian nobility. There was almost nothing um, because probably they would regularly go to Prague. Um, I don't know about Brno, but there are just no letters. Whereas the Styrians, um, from one person, for example, 20 letters. And from these letters, you see what their level of connoisseurship was, what their desires was, what was their problem when acquiring the paintings, what they wanted. And um, you can make some conclusions um, about the customers um, that were the regulars. Um, Egenberg, Johann Seifrig, Prince of Egenberg, the owner of Schloss Egenberg and Schloss Waldstein. He was also a owner of several castles in Carniola um, that were not that significant and well furnished. He was, um, he was one of the first um, clients um, in Styria. And I believe um, he came in contact with the Forkons via his father-in-law, which was um, Eusebius, Carl Eusebius Liechtenstein. Um, he was married to Liechtenstein's daughter. And via the first um, Bohemian Moravian um, uh, um, noble that was actually buying from the Forkons, that was Ferdinand Liechtenstein, who was um, his sister was married uh, with, with um, Dietrich Stein. So um, it is interesting, but if you, um, if you take a look, look at this account book, and this is what Denosé partly, a big part transcribed, but you don't see it in Denosé that well as you see it in the original, all the records of um, Egenberg um, are followed by Liechtenstein and the other way around. So you see that they actually communicating about their purchases. Um, and some of them um, were actually very similar. So these two paintings were the most precious paintings. Um, this one, uh, Jan Brechel the Elder, um, the most precious painting that actually he sold 
um, uh, the, the Falcon sold to, to any of the Austrian clients. And it is quite interesting, this was done in 1673, and in 1674, Carl uh, Eusebius, he, he is offered a work of Peter Brugel, and this is this work for only 100 florins. Um, and now it's, it's um, attributed to Jan Brugel the Younger. So uh, you um, wonder about the, the, the quality security um, that the Forcons provided to their customers. Uh, these two battle scenes were bought and are now in Ljubljana because of the subsequent transfers and purchases from other um, uh, aristocrats. Uh, they were sold to Egenberg uh, also in 1673 um, and um, we know that because also of their sizes match um, and another one, for example, Hotfried Maas. Uh, three of them were purchased still in 1701, so he was actually purchasing for 30 years almost from them. Um, this was a series of theological virtues, only this one survives um, in Ljubljana. Um, in addition to that, he would also purchase tapestries, and here is the one dispatching um, actually, the offer from Michael Walters to the Forcons um, that they later on traded to Egenberg, and you find this um, it is um, a set of eight tapestries. You find them in his probate inventory as well. Um, I'm just going to check. I'm actually getting too long. Um, and the um, set of tapestries that um, Johann Jakob Count Kiesel, another Styrian, bought in 1674. Actually, we don't know if he placed the purchase or it was uh, Raimondo Montecuccoli, his father-in-law, who interceded because it is exact a time when Johann Jakob would marry his um, daughter. So it could actually, tapestries were often um, um, wedding gift, um, it could um, be such a case also with these tapestries. And the most of the capricious was this uh, uh, Victor Jakob Count Prantek. He was um, very demanding. Uh, he, he was the only one who really insisted on something and didn't get it. He wanted to have a still life, flower still life by the him. And he mentions that every time in 10 subsequent letters. And I think for, Co for Cons got a little bit of tired explaining that, but at that time they did not have a, a, the him to sell. And the guy became quite angry. Um, uh, and. Uh, Another of the Styrian clients, who was a secretary of the Styrian estate, had to interview, intervene, and he actually writes, I'm going to mediate on this subject. I'm going to become a mediator between you guys so that you settle the dispute and that you can still purchase um, to the Forcons. You can still, uh, that he can still purchase from you further on. Um, he had a huge collection of more than 350 works and he bought from the Forcons later on. He got a Heim, we don't know which of the Heim because the Heim was a big, uh, big family. They had several, I don't know which of the Heims they sold him, but he appears to be satisfied. Um, and also he bought uh, one of Van Dyck's uh, paintings and several other um, um, a, a drawing by Rubens from, um, from um, Alexander for Kond. Um, at some point, um, I tried to figure out where the dispute came, um, the dispute between Brantek and um, for Kond came about. Uh, because in his letter he says, you're not responding to my letters. I'm sending to you letters and you just, you just nothing comes from you. And I think they really um, stopped because you see in their letters, they, every letter that they replied, they marked. That below is the time of the, re of the reply. And a couple of the Brandex letters, they just 
do not have this mark. So I think they got a little bit sick of his all the time nagging for, for stuff and he was uh, quite capricious. And there is another collector that I would like to mention and he his him I from because of him I started this research in, of the Forcon's archive and him I didn't find um, in any of the records. Um, he there is no correspondence with him. He doesn't appear as a client, but he still owned uh, a paintings which could be attributed to the Flemish trade. Um, he had more than 300 paintings only in Hlastovic castle when he died. Um, another 100 paintings is in his uh, flat, um, is in his um, house in, um, in the center of Graz, Erasmus Friedrich Count uh, Herberstein. Um, the two paintings survive, these two, it made me think that it could be, I don't know where else he would acquire them elsewhere than from the Flemish dealers, um, although there is no information about, about him being in contact with the Forcons. So, um, and, um, Another thing that is very interesting in the in the paintings that survive from from his legacy is that um, we discover some new information about this paint this um, Antwerp paint he came from Antwerp uh, painter's life um, the two of the still lives that they were uh, signed the signature is very badly visible not only here but also in the live painting it's quite darkened but it says he painted it in 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 graz um, we didn't know this about this painter we know we knew that he painted for danish court around 1665 we knew that he he uh, died in 1668 um, in Ratzenburg and that in 1658 he was present in uh, Bamberg uh, and uh, Würzburg so uh, Graz was uh, um, one of the steps uh, one of his stations and could possibly one of those could be one of those that could travel to Vienna at least in this gap time um, to 65 when he was present in Denmark and of course uh, here is a um, just um, uh, a detail. Um, Herberstein must have been proud of his collection of more than 300 paintings. He did include them in um, the commission of the ceiling paintings. So there are small vignettes from his, his genre works um, in, in his, in his, in his um, decoration of the, the ceiling paintings. And it is the same Egenberg um, did with his own, uh, with his own collection uh, acquired by the Forcons. Um, and just to conclude with the sculptures, not with paintings, um, the two um, of, the, um, of the statuettes remaining from Herberstein's Kunstkammer in which he held um, around 50, 60 items, including some, some, uh, some statuettes. These two were evaluated at 30 and 40 guilders, so very little. But we see Stefan Godel, Leonhard Mar, this is, um, this is one, an important um, item from Ferdinand's Kunsthammer. I have no idea how he acquired them. I tried to, to go back or go front from, from the Ferdinand's collection. Um, yeah, this is, this is where my study um, stopped and this is probably the, the starting point in which it will continue. Um, thank you.